The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. There are two possibilities with that. One possibility is it's just sort of an interesting, though, somewhat risque bit of trivia. The, the other possibility goes like this. Some of you know Steve Jobs, the CEO of Apple Computer, the past CEO of Apple Computer. He was legendary for his Apple presentations, his yearly presentations. And he would typically do a presentation like this. He'd spend 45 minutes going through sort of a new operating system, talk about some budgetary matters, and he'd begin to walk off the stage. And he'd say, oh, and, and there's one more thing. And there's one more thing. And then he would whip out an iPhone that was being introduced for the first time, or an iPad. He would bring out this product that was, that was revolutionary, and it was the most important feature of the entire talk. The scripture with this particular passage is saying, oh, and one more thing, <laughs> one more thing. And if this thing is true, there was a time when shame was not part of the human dilemma. It's somewhat encouraging. Okay. If it's true, this is a setup. <laughs> and their eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked. Okay. This is the very first feature of the fall. If this is true, we are being introduced to the human dilemma. This is the problem that we struggle with, and it is the problem that, if we're onto it, we anticipate that Scripture is going to speak to this over and over and over again in a way that is shocking and jaw-dropping and glorious and life-changing. And one more thing, and this is very, very important. Here's, let me give you, let me give you one, one thing to take home already. What you're going to hear through all these presentations is, or think, they're, they're always going to be counterintuitive. But here's going to be the, the, the most important counterintuitive message. Are you familiar with shame? Are you familiar with it? Do you, is, it, is it palpable? Is it something you can identify in your life just about every day? If so, you are one of God's people. He has a unique, what you will see throughout Scripture, is he has a unique affection for you. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? The opposite of what we think. Here's what I'd like to do this morning. I'd like to, to first make a few distinctions and definitions, especially between guilt and shame. I'd like to then try to identify it to make sure we can see its, its, its various presentations. And then I'd like first to just go through some of the enticing Old Testament trajectories that point the way for this shocking, draw-dropping, counterintuitive way our God is going to speak to the most profound human dilemma. Let's begin with just, just a couple... Uh, could you go back to the, 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 first, the first slide on guilt? Let's make a few distinctions between guilt and shame. This is, with guilt we're familiar with, shame not so much. But once you're on to shame, you will see it everywhere. There are some distinctions, however. Notice them, some of these distinctions. Guilt, the, the imagery is, is usually a courtroom. Not exclusively a courtroom, as we'll find, but it's usually you find yourself in a courtroom. And in this courtroom, there's only one gaze that matters. <laughs> whether there are other people in the courtroom or not, it's irrelevant. Whether there's a jury, whether there's an audience, one gaze and one gaze alone matters, and it's the gaze of the judge himself. The reality is you are legally liable before God, and what you need is rescue. You need salvation. Salvation in terms of forgiveness of sins, which is secured by Jesus and only by Jesus. So in response to his continual appeals, you turn toward the slain and the risen lamb, and you turn away from your sin. That's guilt. We're familiar with guilt. 
Shame is, is, is actually the much larger category. Look at shame and how it's, 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 it's encompassing. It's even going to encompass guilt. In, in shame, the imagery is, is, is more or less you are in the public square. The, all eyes are on you. And so, some eyes are staring. Some eyes are actually turned away because, because of, your, of your loathsomeness, if you will. It's very, very public. The basic idea is that you are not acceptable before God and other people because you are a sinner. Now, when you see sinner in quotes, the the scripture is saying, of course, all of us are sinners, but there are some of us who are known by our sins. Most of us are probably not known by our sins, but some are. Oh, there's Joe, the unfaithful one. Okay. There's, there, there, there's Joe, the, the pornographer. Those, those would be people who experience shame because they are known by their sins. Or you have been humiliated, and this is a critical extension of shame. You have been humiliated by the sins of other people. You need rescue. Yes, indeed, you need forgiveness of sins. But you also need, and this will be a triad that we come back to often in identifying shame. You also need covering because you experience nakedness. You also need inclusion because you feel like an outcast. You also need cleansing because you feel contaminated. And these are especially true when you've been humiliated by others. And these, of course, are benefits that are secured by Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ. In response to the continual appeals of Jesus, you touch the Holy One and he touches you back. (laughs) That will be one of the images we use for, for God's just amazing, shocking response to our own experience with shame. And he becomes your refuge. And perhaps if we could go on, and this is, this is what he's going to say. You are, you are no longer a person identified by your shame, but you are a saint. You are a holy one, and holy one means a number of different things, but at least means that you belong to God. Could you imagine anything grander for those of us who struggle profoundly with the experience of shame? The... Guilt comes on to human experience right in the beginning. We have done wrong. Okay? And, and, and the legal and forensic feature of guilt is there. But notice that ultimately what you find in the garden is shame becomes the container for our experience of guilt. You, you see what I'm saying? That, that certainly guilt is legal liability before God, but notice the initial experiences of guilt are those things that we're identifying as shame. You feel exposed, you feel naked, you feel utterly worthless, you feel like a failure, you feel, and you are an outcast, you're contaminated, you are disgraced. This is, this is good news because, because many of us struggle with guilt and we might know forgiveness of sins, but the, the challenge is that we can go into the courtroom, the judge pronounces us not guilty, and we leave the courtroom and we still feel naked, <laughs> exposed in the public square, we still feel contaminated, we feel like an outcast, we still feel like scum. <laughs> and here is scripture, saying that the benefits of Jesus will extend to that legal liability, but also our nakedness, our being an outcast, our being contaminated. Scripture goes on, and and as shame matures, meaning as we follow shame throughout Scripture, there are two things that seem to happen with this category. One is that there is a part of guilt that sort of sticks its nose out from, from shame's huge tent. And let me see if I can identify some of those features of sin. For example, those sins that you can speak about publicly and everybody will be nodding their heads. They're with you rather than staring at you. Uh, For example, let's see. um, I I tend to roll through stop signs occasionally. Um, 
I think some of you just said, that should be a shameful one, Ed. I, uh, here's one. Um, I can be selfish in my relationship with my wife at times. Okay. Now, okay. I, I, I'm really glad that my wife didn't say amen just then because, because that would have been shameful. Okay. She must be tired this morning. That's why she didn't say it. Uh, but you understand what I'm saying. Those, there, there are sins that all of us are willing to recognize in some way that aren't ultimately shameful. Actually, you know, they, 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 they draw us all in. Okay? That's one thing that happens is shame matures. A second thing that happens is that it accumulates this other category of rejection and being humiliated at the hands of other people. And this is very, very good news. <laughs> For those of you who know forgiveness of sins and, and, sins and have left the courtroom, you still can live with that sense of rejection and being unacceptable before especially other people and many times before God himself. So, so even these def- definitions, they're very good news because the scripture is savvy with this fundamental human dilemma. Okay? And it is going to speak profoundly to it. Let's, before we jump into scripture briefly, let's do this. Let's, now we have some idea of the territory of shame and how it, it, it contains actually the majority of guilt. Let's, let's see if we can find it a bit in our own lives and in those of our friends around us so we can bring these good words of scripture deeply to our hearts. For example, a, a woman I know who, who is truly a sinner she, she struggles with pedophilia. She, she has an unusual attraction to, to infants. Okay. Now, she got up here and, and spoke of this. Nobody would be shaking their heads. Okay. If, if you saw her afterwards, you might have a tendency to avoid her. Okay. Here's a woman who every single hour of her life okay, struggles with being identified by that particular sin. Okay. Some of us, when we're talking about shame, it's because we are sinners. A, a good friend of mine who had been unfaithful to his wife many years ago, I, I, I spoke with him recently, and, and as he spoke about the difficulties that his unfaithfulness had brought, you could see the typical posture of shame. He, his, his head was bowed low, and this is 15 years after the event. There's something about shame that is much different than embarrassment. Embarrassment is the kind of thing that uh, people turn away from us or we don't want to be seen for a moment because of what we've done, but the next day it's not a problem. Shame, the nature of shame, when it is not attended to, it will persist and it will persist, and it seems as if it will grow. So 10 years later, the, the, the feeling of shame is more intense rather than less. That's one way that you might encounter the experience of shame because you are known by particular sins and by particular public sins. One of the ways scripture captures the experience of shame is by way of poverty and destitution. Those who had nothing, they were nothing. <laughs> they were big fat zeros. They, they, had, they, they, they must, it seems, have been under the judgment of God for them to be so thoroughly destitute. And how many of us have, the, have had the experience of, of, of asking for something from another person? Sometimes even asking another person to pray for us can be a very challenging thing because we're acknowledging our spiritual poverty. A, the, ideal situ, the ideal story there probably would be the story of Naomi where here's a woman familiar with shame, where she lost husband, she lost children, she lost land, and she was coming back to Israel with her tail between her legs. Okay? That is a picture of shame. Okay? But uh, it's too enticing a trajectory. And you remember what happens with the story of Naomi? Okay? It, is a, it is a story that we will find over and over and over again in scripture this pronounced form of public shame in this woman, by the end of the story, and it's a fairly short story, by the end of the story, Jesus is sitting on her lap. 
Okay. She is in the line of the Messiah. Could there be any greater honor than that? Okay. What you're going to find, if you, if you know one thing, it's this. That, that you have a God. If you're familiar with shame, you're just the kind of person that he is looking for. Okay. If you do not experience shame, if you can't identify smidgens of it in your own life this morning, then you have, then you have some reason to doubt God's love. Because as you go through scripture, it seems as though all he cares about are those who struggle with guilt and shame. Some other examples just to, just to try to identify this. Don't forget, the problem of guilt is easy for us to identify. And if you're in an Asian culture or an African culture, shame also is easy to identify. But in Western culture, it has become submerged under problems such as low self-esteem. Uh, and this inept form of positive thinking has become the only way we've been able to deal with it. Even in the Christian church, you will find much more conversations about guilt than you do about shame when the scripture seems seems to be about shame that encompasses guilt from first to last. So since shame has not been part of our ecclesiastical discussion for the last few decades, we have to first be able to identify it a bit before we're able to, to see scripture come alive with, with powerful, powerful words. Do you feel different? Do you feel racially different? Do you feel physically different? I'm thinking particularly about another friend of mine who, who grew up with learning differences. And, and when he was 28, he, had a, he, he read a description of those differences and he began to cry. And he began to cry because for the first time, he felt inclusion. And what, it's sort of a lame version of inclusion, wasn't it? He, there was one person in one book who identified his experience and he was able to say, that's me. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I feel like somebody understands me. I am, I am somehow with this other person. Okay? You feel different. Okay? That's certainly, that's, that sense of being an outcast, being seen or being, or being unseen and being worthless. Those are some of the experiences of, of shame. You have the experience of being a failure. Okay? a sense that you haven't measured up. If you were in public ministry, certainly, certainly you're familiar with this. How many times have, have you uh, spoken publicly and, and when you're talking to people afterwards, nobody says one word about anything that you said? Okay. Uh, which is the reason why most pastors during Mondays, they don't want to see too many other people. Okay. That's sort of this little sort of depression dip in uh, an otherwise emotionally stable kind of life. Okay. The experience of being a failure, especially when it's public. The sense of being a fraud. A, and the successes tend to struggle with this. People who are successful, there's this, there's this undercurrent that says, if I, will, if I ever will be found out, I don't deserve these successes. If I'm ever found out, people will truly see my incompetencies. You see it? It's that experience of naked, and I need some sort of covering, and temporarily my successes are covering me, but most people who have success have this peculiar sense that it is not going to be sufficient. Try to identify this experience of, of shame in your own life. The experience of rejection. Just give you one illustration very quickly here. A, a friend of mine, this might seem like a, a fairly innocuous story, but consider it. His father took him to a baseball game. And I, it, this, is, this, this is me just asking about his life very briefly. This is his first story. His father took him to a baseball game. And at the baseball game, he was, there was a person sitting next to him on the other side. And my, my friend was probably 10, 11, 12 years old. And his father spoke baseball to the person next to him for the entire game, never acknowledged his son, never, never introduced his son to the person next to him. Now, on one hand, we could say, 
come on, the father's taking him to a baseball game and it was an expensive day. On the other hand, here is he saying, here's one story that captures my experience of life and here's an ordinary guy active in your church and he's saying, this is what life feels like for me every single day. I haven't measured up to those people who are important in my life. I am seen as some kind of reject. Ah, <laughs> You are just the kind of person okay, that, that scripture seems to target. You are just the kind of person who seems to be the recipient of our Father's unique affection. And of course, if you've been violated, especially sexually violated, you palpably experience shame, always, okay, unless you are momentarily distracted. A, a woman that I knew who had been sexually violated. She was, she was particularly quiet one, one Sunday, and, and so quiet that I, you're an active woman in our church, so, so quiet that I, I asked, well, what's, you know, you seemed a little quieter on Sunday, anything, anything happening? And she said, I was, I was afraid to open my mouth because if I opened my mouth, black bile was going to come out on other people. Okay? And she was speaking almost literally. Okay? In other words, I am such a loathsome, disgraced, vile, discarded person. If I open my mouth, the contamination may come out and sully other people, and I didn't want to make the world around me unclean. And here's a woman, if you saw her in your church, she'd be an active member, <laughs> part of worship, and just involved in a number of different ministries. Are you... Are you beginning to identify this particular experience? It's, once, you're, once you get onto it, you can find it everywhere. <laughs> that triad of just, you, you, you want to be somehow covered by perhaps a resume. <laughs> so you, you want to have some kind of reputation you're afraid to be seen. This sense, and isn't this true? If you're an American, you have this sense. You never feel like you're quite belong. Okay. Everybody else seems to be part of it and you're a bystander on the outside. Or that sense of being, there's something wrong with me. There's something sullied. There's something dirty about me. That's the triad that we're after in identifying this experience of shame, which is the container to also understand the experience of guilt. So, we're familiar with being unpresentable being unacceptable before other people, and sometimes before God himself. Now, let's dive in. <laughs> let's, let's see some of those enticing trajectories that, that scripture offers to us. Okay. I'll limit my comments to the Old Testament, uh, and, and if they're beautiful in the Old Testament, how much more beautiful they're gonna be as the, as the weekend continues. The naked covered, <clears throat> the the outcast accepted and part of the group. The, the unclean thoroughly washed inside and out. Honor, okay. these are some of the things we're looking for in scripture. Glory, okay. holiness, these beauty. These are some of the things we're trying to identify as we are looking at the human dilemma. Let's begin with, with the experience that most of us are familiar with, that sense of I don't quite fit. I feel like an outcast, somehow banished, and everybody else in the membership seems to be doing well. Here is, here is the story of scripture. We are indeed exiled people from the garden. And the curious thing though is that God says, leave, you can, this is no longer your garden because this is my territory and you've chosen not to live in my territory. What you don't see is that God himself pursues us as we leave the garden. <laughs> he pursues banished people, who would have thought? And let me give you a couple passages from Hosea. Okay? Have you been able to identify this in your own life? Okay? Are you intrigued by the possibility that if you're familiar with shame, then, then the Lord has an unusually unique affection for you? The shamed are, that is a characteristic feature of his people. Here's what scripture says, and I'm reading some passages from Hosea here. Hosea chapter 10, 
Do you see what we're suggesting is that all scripture is now dealing with this primary human dilemma in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. That's shame. You are the outcasts. You are not my people. They shall be called sons of the living God. Do you see how this is the Lord saying, I know your primary dilemma, let me speak to it. And let me speak to it again and and again and again and again and infuse you with hope for the coming of Christ where everything is going to explode in this new reality. Hosea, again, this is even... This is even more precious. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. They will say, you are my God. I was was teaching a class, and and I have a tendency to refer to my wife much more often than I probably should, and, and, and I would refer to her in class as my wife. And there was a student who came up, you know, probably midway through the semester, and and. And he asked, you know, why do you always talk about your wife as my wife? Why don't you call her her name? I think he was being just a bit critical. I mean, the woman has a name, doesn't she? Why do you have to call her my wife? And, and I, I didn't have to think about it for a moment. Everybody can call her Sherry. Okay? But I'm the only one who can say my wife. Okay? The, that possessive pronoun changes everything. Okay? Two things that you, you could do. Be, be, be filled with a bit of hope that if you're familiar with shame, the Lord is pursuing you, okay? a unique interest in you. Okay? The second thing, consider in light of what Scripture says to, to disgraceful people, okay? and they were disgraceful people in the book of Hosea, consider a God who says, call me this, call me my God. Okay? Uh, as, as he calls us, my people. Okay. Do you, see, you see this enticing trajectory that is only going to get better. Okay. Then Hosea 2.16. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. <laughs> Try that. Try that in your prayer over, the le- over the, this weekend. My husband... Thank you for your mercy. The outcasts are are known and they're being included. Consider another passage in scripture that that focuses, and there are are thousands of passages. I'm just giving you some of the highlights that most of you are probably familiar with. Isaiah chapter 55. There's something about a meal with other people that is intimate. There's something about a meal that that joins us together. Okay. Uh, in the New Testament and Old Testament times in particular, to have someone over for a meal was saying, you are my people. <laughs> I am associated with you and you are associated with me. And here's what our God says, come, come, all you who are thirsty, okay. all you who are poor and destitute. He's identifying he's the shameful right now. They're the ones who are being invited. Okay. Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and, and eat. Come buy wine and milk. He's emphasizing our poverty again, which is one of the ways scripture identifies shame. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what's not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and your soul will enjoy the richest of fare. We have some friends who invite us over for a meal. They called us on a Saturday morning. Invite us over for a meal that Saturday night. Hey, why don't you come over? Just, you know, we'll just put a little something together. It'll be nice to be able to get together. I think they were gonna be going away. And, and we got to the meal. We were, first of all, we were blessed to be invited to the meal. We got to the meal and it became evident as we saw what was being offered that they had spent the entire day creating this meal. (laughs) How can you not feel honored in such a place? (laughs) How can you not feel humbled? Here are people saying, I love you. (laughs) And it was my delight to prepare this meal this entire day. (laughs) And if it took a week, I'd be delighted to do it. Come. Come, you who are thirsty. Come buy. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost and your soul will delight in the richest affair. 
Do you see how here is a text that we all know, but when you identify yourself as struggling with shame, all of a sudden it becomes your text and it is dealing with the deepest and most profound problem of human life. Let's consider just a a couple other stories from from the Old Testament. A sense of being naked and, and exposed. The, the first thing God does is he, is he covers us with animal skins. Well, I, I don't know exactly how you interpret that particular passage, but, but I suspect that at that particular time in history, to be covered with animal skins, to be t- covered with dead animals, was not really a very fine garment. Okay? In some ways, there has to be a message in it saying, if you want to act like an animal, or if you want to follow an animal, if you want to be associated with an animal, then here, let me dress you as an animal. Okay? But that's not the final word. Very early on in, in human history, in Exodus chapter 28, this is what the Lord says. And these words jump out. Make garments for Aaron and the priests that will give them dignity and honor. Okay? It's those words. Dignity and honor in contrast to shame. And then it it talks about these beautiful garments where God is ultimately the tailor for these garments. They are utterly exquisite. And and then there's a turban. You remember what the turban says? Holy to the Lord. Holy to the Lord. You see, here is our problem. We We are naked and exposed. And scripture, our God knows such things and he is in the process of dressing us. And actually, the dressing gets even better than this. <laughs> but consider what it was like to be a person who's familiar with Genesis and, 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 and the nakedness and shame, to be familiar with being a slave where you probably did not have clothes that were respectable to the people around you. And here are these exquisite priestly garments and, and none of us would be thinking, well, what about me? These are the priests, and, and, but, but I'm not allowed to wear these. No. In, in that culture, you knew that the priest was your representative. When he was wearing these beautiful garments, somehow the Lord was investing you with beauty as well. Do you see these amazing, enticing trajectories dealing with this fundamental problem that all of us are looking for a solution. And if it's only going to be in, in, in forgiveness of sins, in a legal sense, it doesn't capture the totality of the benefits of Jesus Christ. You feel contaminated? Well, let me just give you one quick one here. Isaiah chapter six. We're all familiar with Isaiah chapter six. But here's Isaiah chapter six. A contaminated, shameful person ends up showing up in the courtroom of the king, uh, in, in, in the hall of the king before the holy one, and he assumes that he is dead. Okay? But he's not. And here's what the holy one does. By way of a seraph, by way of an intermediary, something comes from the altar of God, and it touches Isaiah's lips. It touches Isaiah's lips. It's just... It's just a setup for a time when God is going to come close. He will no longer use a seraph to touch. But when something, when God himself, or even in this case, something that belongs to God touches us, it changes us, and somehow it renders the unclean person holy. And notice what Isaiah does. Who shall I send? And all of a sudden, this shame person who is now cleansed and belonging to God, he pops up as a, as a volunteer. Now, what you're going to find is Scripture talks about this transition from, from shame to holiness, this transition from shame to, to covering, to being included, to cleansing, to glory, to beauty, to honor. It, it is not something that somehow we've earned, that somehow we've We've, we've done better. We've, we've, we've distanced ourselves from bad associations. We're no longer humiliated. The scripture says that most of these things are about your associations. Who are you joined with? Obviously, in the garden, if you're joined with a serpent, 
it is not a very honoring thing. <laughs> Rather than being associated with the Most High God, you chose to be associated with a particular beast. It is about our associations. And for those of you who are familiar with sexual violence, you know this very keenly. You feel this association with a person or people who have humiliated you. And you feel like there has been no way to somehow cut these contaminating links and ties that you have. Here's Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah is, is, is using, by way of the Holy Spirit, he is using an example of shame, which we see throughout scripture, of, of people who, to whom you cannot say, but you don't understand my shame. He's, he's taking representatives that in that culture are the severest form of shame. And here's a barren woman, okay? A barren woman who, if, if a woman's place in that particular culture was to have children, that's the way they would image God. Barrenness was seen at that point as a great curse. They were under God. They must have been excluded from the people. And this is Isaiah 54. You know how it goes. Single barren woman, you who never bore a child, Enticing? Draw you in? Burst into song, shout for joy. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Don't hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Did you hear me? (laughs) Don't fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. Somehow it will be detached from you. And here's how it works. For your maker is your husband. Your maker is your husband. He is the one, it's about our associations. He is the one that somehow breaks off the the rejection links and the humiliation links that tend to comprise so much of our life. And he says, your maker is your husband. Now he has taken your reputation and you take on his reputation. It is a swap. It is about whom we are associated with. And here it is in the Old Testament, just just, just setting the stage for what's to come. Your maker is your husband. Okay. And when your maker is your husband, Lord Almighty is his name, the Holy One of Israel is his name, there is indeed no way that the shame has, has this permanent place in our beings. Well, this is just a, a brief intro into just such an essential topic, isn't it? But there's already lots to do, and here's, here's some of the things that that I think we can consider. One, recognize if you struggle with guilt and shame, guilt and shame is paralytic, tends to, tends to freeze us spiritually. We tend to, or we tend to wither spiritually. Growth in the presence of guilt and shame, it can, they cannot coexist. If you are wrestling with guilt and shame, if that is a palpable experience, growth is something perhaps you, you you could only dream about. Okay. High alert. Okay. This, is, this is an essential topic. Please be a person of hope as we're just jumping into it. Okay. Second thing, feel dirty? Feel like you don't belong? Well, it just so happens that just about every page of scripture is about you. <laughs> and if you can't find that sense of not belonging, that sense of nakedness, that sense of contamination, if you can't if you can't identify that at all, you're, you're gonna be a little bit worried, okay? Be stunned. If you are familiar with shame, you have a God who for some reason has this unique interest in you, and he will pursue you and pursue you and pursue you, and he will, la- he will, he will offer and lavish these beautiful words and beautiful deeds on you until you finally give up and say, say, I trust you, and I trust the things that you've actually said. Try this, try my God, try my husband. There's lots we can do. And obviously, come back a little bit later this morning as as it gets even better. And as Dave talks about shame, uh, as now it's addressed with Jesus. Because we're only talking about before Jesus. And one more thing, okay? And one more thing. To, to take on the name of an honorable person is a, is a shocking thing that changes our reputation. 
A blessing is, it means that you are being shown favor by the person who is blessing you. Here's the word of the Lord. Okay? The Lord bless you. And he's familiar with bad people. Okay? The Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. He's not turning away. He is turned toward you with favor. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. And then the passage goes on. So shall the priests place my name on the people and bless them. 